You're watching Bread and Roses. Welcome everyone. I'm Marina Mazi. I'm Fadi Puya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about the Court of Appeals decision that gender segregation at an Islamic school in Birmingham is discriminatory. Really? It's about time. Hopefully the beginning of an end of gender segregation in Britain. Definitely better be. Yes, this week's interview is Luna Marquea. Hopefully I'm pronouncing her name right from a Danish humanist on blasphemy law in Denmark. We'll also be talking about the insane fatwa uh, that uh, says that uh, clicking on photos and Facebook and everything is anti-Islamic, un-Islamic. And our slice of life is uh, an action in Mexico by retired UNICEF uh, employees in defense of uh, Baqir Namazi, who is in prison in Iran. Don't go away, stay with us. The Court of Appeals has decided that gender segregation at Al Hijra School in Birmingham is a discriminatory, and I think this is such an important victory because finally you have a court saying that it is discrimination. Segregating people based on gender is just as bad as racial segregation, and it is a form of apartheid, and it's it's discriminatory, particularly because it's separating girls from boys. You know, they're not separate but equal. They're actually unequal, and it's a way of reinforcing that inequity. Absolutely, and especially from the early age, the psychological impact and the, you know, the pressure of self-image of children at that age uh, is, is such a, a terrifying and negative impact it has on, on the uh, mind of children and, and is damaging. I think that's a, it's a great victory. But this is uh, Islamist policy. Mm -hmm. In everywhere, they've tried to implement it in universities, in colleges, in schools, in in social sort of environment. They try to do this day in day out, and it must be confronted. So this is the beginning of the end. There's been a big fight uh, to expose the gender segregation as damaging and reactionary. This is the beginning, and I think we need to work to make sure that everywhere is seen as sex, uh, sexual apartheid, and is actually exactly the same as. Uh, uh, racial apartheid and it needs to be frowned upon in all yeah, parts and, of the and society. And one of the other important issues is the fact that this is a school. Schools are meant to be places of learning, places that level the playing field for all children irrespective of their backgrounds or their parents' beliefs. And here you have uh, you know, uh, evidence of how detrimental it is to have religion having a role in uh, edu in the educational system and I think gender segregation is one aspect of it but it's also teaching girls that they need to be in the home a lot of the books that were found at that school for example said that women are the weaker sex for example they need to stay at home uh, you know things that are really yeah. deeply misogynist and have you know imposing regressive gender norms on, on children. Yeah, you know? and, and the language of rights that the Islamists use, you know, this scenario has actually exposes that, they actually use the language of right and democratic rights to further the most reactionary and unequal uh, and discriminatory policies. Yes, yeah, so this is a great, great victory and hopefully it, as you said, will be the beginning of the end of gender segregation at schools, at universities, and a recognition that it is really discrimination, nothing less. Loon, it's a lovely pleasure to have you on our program. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about the situation in Denmark. In your talk at the Polish Atheist event, you spoke about the fact that you're seeing a rise in Christian identity. Can you explain what that is and why that's come about? Yes, uh, um, for example, the, 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 two f the government we have now in Denmark, it's a center-right-wing government. And they written in the uh, foundation of the government that Denmark is a Christian country. And we, we, we have never seen that in Danish politics before. This government and the, for, the former government was the first one who did that. And, and it's, um, 
I think it's an absurdity to to put in in the in the foundation of a government to say that Dan Denmark is a Christian country. Of course, we have a culturally Christian tradition in Denmark, but but uh, to to first of all, it's absurd to say that a country is anything because it's the people in the country that could be something and and uh, Christianity isn't really. Um, actual for most of pe of the people in Denmark so there is this rise of and I think it's the it's the old uh, clash of civilizations things that we see a lot of we not a lot but we have our share of, of uh, Islamist uh, immigrants to Denmark and so so we respond to that uh, unknown factor in Denmark with more religion and so we say oh we are Christians so that's a response to the the religion that we don't understand I think and you talk about a paradox between a sort of having uh, the Christianity as a official religion versus a secular sort of society. Yes, yeah, it is really a, a, a very big paradox in the Danish society because we have a state, a Lutheran a state church in Denmark, and um, it's in the the constitution of the, the Danish constitution it says that the Lutheran church is the Danish people church and the state should support the Lutheran church it's in, in the constitution that's from 1849 um, but most of the Danish people are not they 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 are not very religious and it's it's not a factor in their everyday life they use the church in in the you know ceremonies that in in rites of passage in their life for baptism and for, for weddings and for funerals but, but they are not, if you ask them, are you a religious person, they would say no. And at the same time, 76% of the Danish populations are a member of the state church. But, but, but the religion is not a factor in the society as such, so it's, it's a strange paradox. So it is worrying when you have uh, parties and uh uh, politicians talking about a Christian Denmark. Uh, it's it's quite regressive sort of. Yes, it position. is. Yeah, it is. It really is. And for for example, we don't have a Christian party in the Danish parliament. Uh, we have that in some in, in Norway. There is, and I don't know about Sweden. But 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 Christianity hasn't really been an, a factor in politics. At the same time as we have this state church, but but it's not it's not an active factor in politics. So it's it is truly is regression, I think. And you talked also about a return of sort of blasphemy laws and rules. Uh, can you explain what that fight is now over the rules there? Yes, uh, in the Danish penal code we have a blasphemy paragraph. It's it's paragraph 140, and it says that you cannot inside publicly uh, criticize people's belief or worship uh, so it's a victimless crimes because it's against belief or worship uh, and and we had we had this paragraph and we had had it for a long time and it's not been actualized uh, since 1946 where some people were, were indicted for dressing up as, as priests and baptizing a doll in the streets and they got the, a fine for that so that's the last time it, it was actualized and and it's really interesting because during the cartoon crisis in Denmark it wasn't actualized and that's that's an interesting paradox because why not that's that's interesting yes uh, but but the, in the aftermath of the cartoon crisis there was a discussion about this blasphemy law what is because it wasn't actualized during this cartoon crisis we got to discussing then what is blasphemy and why do we have this paragraph and where can we use it um, so we have had this discussion for some time and the the juridical department of the Danish Parliament they they answered uh, to a question about this that that um, it could for example be the burning of holy books that that could be blasphemy so now we have this uh, actual case where uh, a man was uh, indicted with uh, burning the Quran, uh, and and it I th I think it's it's actually a response to this response from the juridical departments to see okay then you say that blasphemy is burning of holy books now we have a man who burned a holy book so let's. Uh, say this is blasphemy and, and let's test if you really want to use this paragraph and if you really mean that in the Danish democratic secular society of 2017 you cannot do this because it's, uh, it's blasphemy. So what's up, happened with that case so far? 
so far, uh, so far nothing has happened. He has been indicted and it's not been taken any further. But just this Tuesday, it led to that that uh, the Socialist Party of Denmark uh, proposed to abolish the blasphemy law, and they were actually backed by two. One center party and one uh, right wing party. So, so maybe, maybe this just uh, inciting this case will lead to the abolishment of the blasphemy law. And, and quite frankly, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it, they will condemn this man of blasphemy and say, no, you, you cannot uh, do this. Um, and maybe they will say, no, we should abolish this law. I mean, the the person himself uh, who's been indicted, he's. Uh quite a bigot and a racist uh, as yes, well as yes, yeah. but but that's separate from this as a blasphemy law which is being able to criticize religion and religious books yes exactly he hasn't been indicted of racism for example which is quite interesting but uh, but in some ways i think it's a good thing because then we have this clear cut blasphemy discussion and i think we need that in denmark because i think we have an international responsibility to abolish our blasphemy law why do you say that about the international responsibility? It's, it's because that if when we as a, a secular Western country has this blasphemy paragraph in our penal code, other countries where this is deadly serious, they can point to us and say, well, look at this Denmark, they also have a blasphemy law, then, then uh, it, it must be all right to have a blasphemy law. And I know for a fact that the former special rapporteur in UN uh, on freedom of religion and belief, belief, Heiner Bielefeld, he visited Denmark last year and he told me that he was at a conference, a UN conference, when he, where he heard a Saudi Arabian say, well, look at Denmark, they have a blasphemy law, so it must be okay. And we don't have, we don't have laws that that uh, permits uh, incest or child labor or stuff like that, uh, for, uh, because we think it's wrong, and and we think it's wrong to kill people for blasphemy. So we shouldn't have a law that allows to the persecution of, of atheists and yeah. your band which by the way runs schools and Sharia courts in this country anyway they've issued another stupid fatwa but before we even get into that what's even stupider than that is that there's some stupid person asking them for advice which is why they then come and give these stupid fatwa so it's just like a circle of you know stupidity. Of stupidity. <laughs> and so they ask they've basically asked if they're permitted to put Pictures click, click on photos on, in, on, 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 on Facebook on and WhatsApp, media. Yeah. yeah. And the guy what has been the and, and, drum roll piece. And the, yeah, absolutely. The, and, the and, and, and the response has been in Islam, you can't click. <laughs> so if you can't click, how can you put photos on WhatsApp and Facebook? Because then you have to click them. So in Islam, is not allowed. So. And of course, you know, it, this is all written in the Quran, you know, Facebook, Twitter, it's all mentioned there very clearly. Yes. So, yeah. You heard it from here first. They are on the top of the and, stupid fatwa. And you were saying that they're having a conference in Egypt. There's another conference from 80 uh, different countries, all the stupid fatwa issuing <laughs> institution taking part into how to regulate the stupid fatwa. And if we had known earlier, we could have been reporting there live. Yes, on the stupid of fatwas. That would have been brilliant. A large group of retired UNICEF employees and their families got together in Mexico to do an action in defense of Bagher Namazi, an eight-year-old uh, prisoner in Iran who's done nothing wrong. And it's just great to see these sort of actions in solidarity and in defense of political prisoners, prisoners there, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's a beautiful. The pressure on the Islamic regime must continue until Bagher Namazi and Siamak Namazi and all other pol political prisoners are set free. Thank you very much for the 65 people, UNICEF retiree, who got together reunion at the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico. Yeah, well it, was, done. it was great, Beef, great, great, great to well see. Done. Anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We hope you found this program interesting. We'll see you again, same time and same place next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.